The coke brazier was elegant enough, but the night watchman was not, consciously at any rate, sensitive to beauty of form. No, he valued the brazier primarily for its warmth. He couldn't make up his mind whether he liked its light. Two days ago, when he first took on the job, he was inclined to suspect the light. It dazzled him, made a target of him, increased his helplessness. It emphasised the darkness. But tonight he was feeling reconciled to it, and aided by its dark, clear rays, he explored his domain, a long, narrow rectangle, fenced off from the road by poles, round and thick as flagposts, and lashed loosely at the ends. By day they seemed simply an obstacle to be straddled over, but at night they were boundaries, defences almost, at their junctions where the warning red lanterns dully gleamed. They bristled like a barricade. The night watchman felt himself in charge of a fortress. He took a turn up and down, musing. Now that the strangeness of the position had worn off, he could think with less effort. The first night he had vaguely wished that the no thoroughfare board had faced him, Instead of staring uselessly up the street, it would have given his thoughts a rallying point. Now he scarcely noticed its blankness. His thoughts were few, but pleasant to dwell on, and in the solitude they had the intensity of sensations. He arranged them in cycles, the rotation coming at the end of ten paces or so, when he turned to go back over his tracks. He enjoyed the thought that held his mind for the moment, but always with some agreeable impatience for the next. If he surmised there would be a fresh development in it, he would deliberately refrain from calling it up, leave it fermenting and ripening, as it were, in a luxury of expectation. The night watchman was a domesticated man with a wife and two children, both babies. One was beginning to talk. Since he took on his job, wages had risen, and everything at home seemed guilt-edged. It made a difference to his wife. When he got home, she would say, as she'd done on the preceding mornings, Well, you do look a wreck. This night work doesn't suit you, I'm sure. The night watchman liked being addressed in that way, and hearing his job described as night work. It showed an easy, competent familiarity with a man's occupation. He would tell her, with the air of one who had seen much, about the incidents of his vigil, and what he hadn't seen he would invent, just for the pleasure of hearing her say, Well, I never. You do have some experiences, and no mistake. He was very fond of his wife. Why, hadn't she promised to patch up the old blue paper blinds, used once for the air raids, but now somewhat out of repair? He hadn't slept well, couldn't get accustomed to sleeping by day. The room was so light. But these blinds would be just the thing, and it would be nice to see them and feel that the war was over and there was no need for them, really. The night watchman yawned, as for the twentieth time, perhaps, he came up sharp against the boundary of his walk. Loss of sleep, no doubt. He would sit in his shelter and rest a bit. As he turned and saw the narrowing gleams that transformed the separating poles into thin lines of fire, he noticed that nearly at the end, just opposite the brazier, in fact, and only a foot or two from the door of his hut, the left line was broken. Someone was sitting on the barrier. His back turned on the night watchman's little compound. Strange. I never heard him come, thought the man, brought back with a jerk from his world of thoughts to the real world of darkness and the deserted street. Well, no, not exactly deserted, for... Here was someone who might be inclined to talk for half an hour or so. The stranger paid no attention to the watchman's slowly advancing tread. A little disconcerting. He stopped. Drunk, I expect, he thought. This would be a real adventure to tell his wife. I told him I wasn't going to stand any rot from him. Now, my fine fellow, you go home to bed. That's the best place for you, I said. He had heard drunk men addressed in that way, and wondered doubtfully whether he would be able to catch the tone. It was more important than the words, he reflected. 
At last, pulling himself together, he walked up to the brazier and coughed loudly, and, feeling ill at ease, set about warming his hands with such energy he nearly burned them. As the stranger took no notice but continued to sit wrapped in thought, the night watchman hazarded a remark to his bent back. "'A fine night,' he said, rather loudly, though it was ridiculous to raise one's voice in an empty street. The stranger did not turn round. "'Yes,' he replied, "'but cold. It will be colder before morning.' The night watchman looked at his brazier, and it struck him that the coke was not lasting so well as on previous nights. "'I'll put some more on,' he thought, picking up a shovel. But instead of the little heap he had expected to see, there was nothing but dust and a few bits of grit. His night's supply had been somehow overlooked. "'Won't you turn round and warm your hands?' he said to the person on the barrier. "'The fire isn't very good, but I can't make it up, for they forgot to give me any extra, unless somebody pinched it when my back was turned.' The night watchman was talking for effect. He did not really believe that anyone had taken the coke. The stranger might have made a movement somewhere about the shoulders. "'Thank you,' he said, "'but I prefer to warm my back.' "'Funny idea, that,' thought the watchman. "'Have you noticed,' proceeded the stranger, "'how easily men forget? "'This coke of yours, I mean. "'It looks as if they didn't care about you very much, "'leaving you in the cold like this.' "'It was true that it had certainly turned colder. "'His visitor had not stirred. "'How oh, I would like to push him off,' the night watchman thought, "'irritated and somehow troubled.' The stranger's voice broke in upon his reflections. "'Do you like this job?' "'Oh, not so bad,' said the man carelessly. "'Good money, you know.' "'Good money?' repeated the stranger scornfully. "'How much do you get?' The night watchman named the sum. "'Are you married? And have you got any children?' the stranger persisted. The night watchman said, "'Yes, without enthusiasm. "'Well,' "'That won't go very far when the children are a bit older,' declared the stranger. "'Have you any prospect of a rise?' The man said no. He had just had one. "'Prices going up, too,' the stranger commented. A change came over the night watchman's outlook. The feeling of hostility and unrest increased. He couldn't deny all this. He longed to say, "'What do you think you're getting at?' and rehearsed the phrase under his breath, but couldn't get himself to utter it aloud." "'Do you find it easy to sleep in the daytime?' asked the stranger presently. "'Not very,' the night watchman admitted. "'Ah,' said the stranger, "'dreadful thing, insomnia.' "'When you can't go to sleep, you mean,' interpreted the night watchman, not without a secret pride. "'Yes,' came the answer. "'Makes a man ill, mad sometimes. "'People have done themselves in sooner than stand the torture.' It was on the tip of the night watchman's tongue to mention that panacea, the blue blinds, but he thought it would sound foolish, and wondered whether they would prove such a sovereign remedy after all. "'What about your children? You won't see much of them,' remarked the stranger. "'While you're on this job, why, they'll grow up without knowing you, up when their papa's in bed, and in bed when he's up. Not that you miss them much, I dare say. Still—' If children don't get fond of their father while they're young, they never will. Why didn't the night watchman take him up warmly, assuring him they were splendid kids? The eldest called him Daddy, and the younger, his wife declared, already recognised him. She knew by its smile, she said. He couldn't have forgotten all that. Half an hour ago, it had been one of his chief thoughts. He was silent. "'I should try and find another job, if I were you,' observed the stranger. "'Otherwise, you won't be able to make both ends meet. "'What will your wife say, then?' "'The man considered. "'At least he thought he was facing the question, "'but his mind was somehow too deeply disturbed, "'and circled wearily and blindly in its misery. "'I was never brought up to a trade,' he said hesitatingly. "'Father's fault.' It struck him that he had never confessed that before, had sworn not to give his father away. What am I coming to, he thought. Then he made an effort. My wife's all right. She'll stick to me. He waited, 
positively dreading the stranger's next attack. Though the fire was burning low, almost obscured under the coke ashes that always seemed more lifeless than any others, he felt drops of perspiration on his forehead, and his clothes, he knew, were soaked. I shall get a chill, that'll be the next thing, he thought. But it was involuntary. Such an idea hadn't occurred to him since he was a child, supposedly delicate. Yes, your wife, said the stranger at last. You won't see much of her either. You leave her pretty much to herself, don't you? Now, with these women, you know, that's a risk. The last word rang like a challenge, but the night watchman had taken the offensive, shot his one little bolt, and the effort had left him more helpless than ever. When the eye doth not see, continued the stranger, the heart doth not grieve. On the contrary, it makes merry, he laughed, as the night watchman could see from the movement of his shoulders. The stranger seemed to have said his say. His head drooped a little more. He might even be dropping off to sleep. Apparently he did not feel the cold. But the night watchman was breathing hard and could scarcely stand. He tottered a little way down his territory, wondering absurdly why the place looked so tidy. But what a travesty of his former progress, and what a confusion in his thoughts, and what a thumping in his temples. Slowly, from the writhing, tearing mass in his mind, a resolve shaped itself. Like a cuckoo, it displaced all others. He loosened the red handkerchief that was knotted round his neck. Without remembering whose fingers had tied it a few hours before, or that it had been promoted, not without washing, to the status of a garment from the menial function of carrying his lunch. It had been an extravagance, that tin carrier, much debated over, and justified finally by the rise of the night watchman's wages. He let the handkerchief drop as he fumbled for the knife in his pocket, but the blade, which was stiff, he got out with little difficulty. Wondering vaguely if he would be able to do it, whether the right movement would come to him, why he hadn't practised it, he took a step towards the brazier. It was the one friendly object in the street. Later in the night, the stranger, without putting his hands on the pole to steady himself, turned round for the first time and regarded the body of the night watchman. He even stepped over it, into the little compound, and remembering perhaps the dead man's invitation, stretched out his hands over the still warm ashes in the brazier. Then he climbed back, and crossing the street, entered a blind alley opposite, leaving a track of dark, irregular footprints. And since he did not return, it is probable that he lived there. Christmas Eve had been, for all the mariners except Mr. Mariner, a most exhausting day. The head of the house usually got off lightly at the festive season. Lightly, that is, as far as personal effort went. Financially, no. Mr. Mariner knew that financially quite a heavy drain was being made on his resources. And later in the evening, when he got out his checkbook to give his customary presents to his family, his relations and the staff, the drain would be heavier. But he could afford it. He could afford it better this Christmas than at any other Christmas in the history of his steadily increasing fortune. And he didn't have to think, he didn't have to choose. He only had to consult a list and add one or two names and cross off one or two. There was quite a big item to cross off, quite a big item, though it didn't figure on the list or on the counterfoil of his checkbook. If he saw fit, he would add the sum so saved to his children's checks. Jeremy and Anne would then think him even more generous than he was, and if his wife made any comment, which she wouldn't, being a tactful woman, he would laugh and call it a capital distribution. Capital in every sense, my dear. But this could wait till after dinner. So of the quartet who sat down to the meal, he was the only one who hadn't spent a laborious day. His wife and Anne had both worked hard, decorating the house, and making arrangements for the party on Boxing Day. They hadn't spent the time in getting presents. They hadn't had to. Anne, who was two years older than Jeremy, 
inherited her mother's gift for present giving, and had made her selections weeks ago. She had a sixth sense for knowing what people wanted, but Jeremy had left it all to the last moment. His method was the reverse of Anne's and much less successful. He thought of the present first and the recipient afterwards. Who would this little box do for? Who would this other little box do for? Who should be the fortunate possessor of this third little box? In present giving, his mind followed a one-way track, and this year it was little boxes. They were expensive and undiscriminating presents, and he was secretly ashamed of them. Now it was too late to do anything more, but when he thought of the three or four friends who had remained unboxed, his conscience smote him. Silent and self-reproachful, he was the first to hear the singing outside the window. Listen, there's some carol singers. His voice, which was breaking, plunged and croaked. The others all stopped talking, and smiles spread over their faces. Quite good, aren't they? The first we've had this year, said Mrs. Mariner. Well, not the first, my dear. They started coming days ago, but I sent them away and said that waits must wait till Christmas Eve. How many of them are there? Two, I think, said Jeremy. A man and a woman. Jeremy got up and drew the curtain. Pierced only by a single distant street lamp, the darkness in the garden pressed against the window pane. I can't quite see, he said, coming back. But I think it's a man and a boy. A man and a boy, said Mr. Mariner. That's rather unusual. Perhaps they're choristers, Daddy. They do sing awfully well. At that moment, the front door bell rang. They listened for the sound of footsteps crossing the stone flags of the hall, but there was none. Mrs. Parfit doesn't come till washing up time, said Mrs. Mariner. Who'll go and give them something? I will. Anne said, jumping up. What shall I give them, Daddy? Oh, give them a bob, said Mr. Mariner, producing the coin from his pocket. However complicated the sum required, he always had it. Anne set off with the light step and glowing face of an eager benefactor. She came back after a minute or two at a much slower pace, and looking puzzled and rather frightened. She didn't sit down, but stood over her place, with her hands on the chair back. He said it wasn't enough she said. Wasn't enough, her father repeated. Did he really say that? Anne nodded. Well, I like his cheek. Even to his family, Mr. Mariner's moods were unforeseeable. By some chance, the man's impudence had touched a sympathetic chord in him. Go back and say that if they sing another, they shall have another bob. But Anne didn't move. If you don't mind, Daddy, I'd rather not. They all three raised questioning faces to hers. You'd rather not? Why? I didn't like his manner. Whose? The man's? Yes, the boy. You were right, Jeremy. It is a boy, quite a small boy. Didn't say anything. Then what was wrong with the man's manner? Mr. Mariner, still genial, asked. Oh, I don't know. And began to breathe quickly, and her fingers tightened on the chair back. And it wasn't only his manner. Henry, I, I shouldn't, began Mrs. Mariner warningly, when suddenly Jeremy jumped up. He saw the chance to redeem himself in his own eyes from his ineffectiveness over the Christmas shopping, from the general ineffectiveness that he was conscious of whenever he compared himself with Anne. Here's the shilling, Anne said, holding it out. He wouldn't take it. This will make it two, their father said, suiting the action to the word but only if they sing again, mind you. While Jeremy was away, they all fell silent, and still trying to compose her features, Mr. Mariner tapping on the table, his wife studying her rings. At last, she said, they're all so class-conscious nowadays. It wasn't that, said Anne. What was it? Before she had time to answer, if she would have answered, the door opened and Jeremy came in, flushed and excited, but also triumphant, with the triumph he had won over himself. He didn't go to his place, but stood away from the table looking at his father. He wouldn't take it, he said. He said it wasn't enough. He said you would know why.
I should know why. Mr. Mariner's frown was an effort to remember something. What sort of a man is he, Jeremy? Tall and thin, with a pulled-in face. And the boy? He looked about seven. He was crying. Is there anyone you know, Henry? asked his wife. I was trying to think. Yes, no, well, yes, I might have known him. Mr. Mariner's agitation was now visible to them all, and even more felt than seen. What did you say, Jeremy? Jeremy's breast swelled. I told him to go away. And has he gone? As though in answer, the bell pealed again. I'll go this time, said Mrs. Mariner. Perhaps I can do something for the child. And she was gone, before her husband's outstretched arm could stop her. Again the trio sat in silence, the children less concerned with themselves than with the gleam that kept coming and going in their father's eyes like a dipping headlight. Mrs. Mariner came back much more self-possessed than either of her children had. I don't think he means any harm, she said. He's a little cracked, that's all. We'd better humour him. He said he wanted to see you, Henry, but I told him you were out. He said that what we offered wasn't enough, and that he wanted what you gave him last year, whatever that means, so I suggest we give him something that isn't money. Perhaps you could spare him one of your boxes, Jeremy. A Christmas box is quite a good idea. He won't take it, said Anne, before Jeremy could speak. Why not? Because he can't said Anne. Can't? What do you mean? Anne shook her head. Her mother didn't press. Well, you are a funny girl, she said. Anyhow, we can but try. Oh, and he said they'd sing us one more carol. They set themselves to listen, and in a moment the strains of God bless you merry gentlemen began. Jeremy got up from the table. I don't think they're singing the words right, he said. He went to the window and opened it, letting in a puff of icy air. Oh, do shut it. Just a moment. I want to make sure. They all listened, and this is what they heard. God blast the master of this house, likewise the mistress too, and all the little children that round the table go. Jeremy shut the window. Did you hear? He croaked. I thought I did, said Mrs. Mariner, but it might have been bless. The words sound so much alike. Henry, dear, don't look so serious. The doorbell rang for the third time. Before the jangling died down, Mr. Mariner rose shakily. No, no, Henry, said his wife, don't go. It'll only encourage them. Besides, I said you were out. He looked at her doubtfully, and the bell rang again, louder than before. They'll soon get tired of it, she said, if no one comes. Henry, I beg you not to go. And when he still stared at her with groping eyes, she added, You can't remember how much you gave him last year. Her husband made an impatient gesture with his hand. But if you go, take one of Jeremy's boxes. It isn't a box they want, he said. It's a bullet. He went to the sideboard and brought out a pistol. It was an old-fashioned saloon pistol, a relic from the days when Henry's father, in common with others of his generation, had practised pistol shooting, and it had lain at the back of a drawer in the sideboard longer than any of them could remember. No, Henry, no, you mustn't get excited. And think of the child. She was on her feet now. They all were. Stay where you are, he snarled. Anne, Jeremy, tell him not to. Try to stop him. But his children could not, in a moment, shake off the obedience of a lifetime, and helplessly they watched him go. But it isn't any good. It isn't any good, Anne kept repeating. What isn't any good, darling? The pistol. You see, I've seen through him. How do you mean, seen through him? Do you mean he's an impostor? No, no, I've really seen through him. Anne's voice sank to a whisper. I saw the street lamp shining through a hole in his head. Darling, darling, yes, and the boy, too. 
Will you be quiet, Anne? cried Jeremy from behind the window curtain. Will you be quiet? They're saying something. Now Dad is pointing the gun at him. He's got him covered. His finger's on the trigger. He's going to shoot. No, he isn't. The man's coming nearer. He's come right up to Daddy. Now he's showing him something, something on his forehead. Oh, if I had a torch. And Daddy's dropped it. He's dropped the gun. As he spoke, they heard the clatter. It was like the sound that gives confirmation to a wireless commentator's words. Jeremy's voice broke out again. He's going off with them. He's going off with them. They're leading him away. Before she or any of them could reach the door, Mrs. Mariner had fainted. The police didn't take long to come. On the grass near the garden gate, they found the body. There were signs of a struggle, a slither like a skid mark on the gravel, heel marks dug deep into the turf. Later it was learnt that Mr. Mariner had died of a coronary thrombosis. Of his assailants, not a trace was found. But the motive couldn't have been robbery. For all the money he had had in his pockets, and all the notes out of his wallet, a large sum, were scattered around him, as if he had made a last attempt to buy his captors off, but couldn't give them enough. The first postcard came from Forfa. I thought you might like a picture of Forfa, it said. You have always been so interested in Scotland, and that is one reason why I am interested in you. I have enjoyed all your books, but do you really get to grips with people? I doubt it. Try to think of this as a handshake from your devoted admirer, W.S. Like other novelists, Walter Streeter was used to getting communications from strangers, but answering them took up the time and energy he needed for his writing, so that he was rather relieved that W.S. had given no address. The photograph of Forfa was uninteresting and he tore it up. His anonymous correspondence criticism, however, lingered in his mind. Did he really fail to come to grips with his characters? Perhaps he did. About ten days later arrived another postcard, this time from Berwick-on-Tweed. What do you think of Berwick-on-Tweed? it said. Like you, it's on the border. I hope this doesn't sound rude. I don't mean that you are a borderline case. You know how much I admire your stories. Some people call them otherworldly. I think you should plump for one world or the other. Another firm handshake from W.S. Otherworldly indeed. He reread the last two chapters he had written. Perhaps they didn't have their feet firm on the ground. And as the days passed, he became uncomfortably aware of self-division, as though someone had taken hold of his personality and was pulling Reconciled and opposing, and it went much slower as he tried to resolve the discord. If only I could correlate the two and make their conflict fruitful, as many artists have. But how could W.S. have known that? And who was W.S., anyhow? For the first time it struck him that the initials were his own. No, not for the first time. He had noticed it before. But they were such commonplace initials. They were Gilberts, they were Morms, they were Shakespeare's. A common possession. Anyone might have them. Yet now it seemed to him an odd coincidence. And the idea came into his mind. Suppose I had been writing postcards to myself. The people did such things. Especially people with split personalities. Not that he was one, of course. He looked at the handwriting again. It had seemed the perfection of ordinariness. Anybody's hand so ordinary as perhaps to be disguised. Now, he fancied, he saw in it resemblances to his own. His being was strung up in expectation of the next postcard. Yet when it came, it took him, as the others had, completely by surprise. He could not bring himself to look at the picture. I hope you are well, and would like a postcard from Coventry, he read. Have you ever been sent to Coventry? I have. In fact, you sent me there. I am getting nearer. Perhaps we shall come to grips after all. I advised you to come to grips with your characters, didn't I? Another hard handshake, as always, W.S. 
A wave of panic surged up in Water Streeter. How was it that he had never noticed all this time the most significant fact about the postcards, that each one came from a place geographically closer to him than the last? I am coming nearer. He took an atlas and idly traced out W.S.'s itinerary. An interval of eighty miles or so seemed to separate the stopping places. Walter lived in a large west country town about ninety miles from Coventry. He had no enemies. He was not a man of strong personal feelings. Such feelings as he had went into his books. In his books he had drawn some pretty nasty characters. Not of recent years, however. Of recent years he had felt a reluctance to draw a very bad man or woman. He thought it morally irresponsible and artistically unconvincing, too. There was good in everyone. But in the past he had let himself go once or twice. He did not remember his old books very well, but there was a character in one, the outcast, into whom he had really got his knife, as if he was a real person whom he was trying to show up. He had never felt a twinge of pity for him, even when he paid the penalty for his misdeeds on the gallows. Odd that he couldn't remember the man's name. He took the book down from the shelf and turned the pages. Even now they affected him uncomfortably. Yes, here it was. William. William. William Stainsforth. His own initials. So uneasy was he that when the next postcard came, it came as a relief. I am quite close now, he read, and involuntarily he turned the postcard over. The glorious central tower of Gloucester Cathedral met his eye. Then, with an effort, he went on reading. All being well, I look forward to seeing you some time this weekend. Then we can really come to grips. As always, W.S. P.S. Does Gloucester remind you of anything? Gloucester Jail? Walter took the postcard straight to the police station, told them of the others, and asked if he could have police protection over the weekend. The officer in charge smiled at him and said he was quite sure it was a hoax, but he would tell someone to keep an eye on the premises. You've uh, no idea who it could be, he asked. Walter shook his head. It was Tuesday. He set himself to work as though he could work, and presently he found he could, differently from before, and, he thought, better. So passed the days, and the dawn of Friday seemed like any other day, until something jerked him out of his self-induced trance, and suddenly he asked himself, When does a weekend begin? A long weekend begins on Friday. At that, his panic returned. He went to the street door and looked out. A car went slowly down the street. Some people crossed it. Everything was normal. And when Saturday came, bringing no postcard, his panic had almost subsided. He nearly rang up the police station to tell them not to bother to send anyone after all. They were as good as their word. They did send someone. Between tea and dinner, the time when weekend guests most commonly arrive, Walter went to the door and there, between two unlit gateposts, he saw a policeman standing, the first policeman he had ever seen in Charlotte Street. At the sight, and at the relief it brought him, he realised how anxious he had been, now he felt safer than he ever felt in his life, and also a little ashamed at having given extra trouble to a hard-worked body of men. Come in, come in, my dear fellow, he exclaimed. He held out his hand, but the policeman did not take it. You must have been very cold standing out there. I didn't know that it was snowing, though, he added, seeing the snowflakes on the policeman's cape and helmet. Come in and warm yourself. Thanks, said the policeman. I don't mind if I do. He looked around. So... This is where you work, he said. Yes, I was writing when you rang. Some poor devils for it, I expect, the policeman said. Oh, why? Walter was hurt by his unfriendly tone and noticed how hard his gooseberry eyes were, said the policeman. The bell rang. Walter excused himself and hurried from the room. 
said a voice. Is that Mr. Streeter? Walter said it was. Well, Mr. Streeter, how is everything at your place? All right, I hope. I'll tell you why I ask. I'm sorry to say we quite forgot about that little job we were going to do for you. Bad coordination, I'm afraid. Would you like us to send somebody now? Yes, but... but yes, please. All right, then. We'll be with you in a jiffy. Walter put back the receiver. What now, he asked himself. A jiffy, they had said. What was a jiffy in terms of minutes? While he was debating, the door opened and his guest came in. No room's private when the street doors once passed, he said. Had you forgotten I was once a policeman? Was, said Walter, edging away from him. You are a policeman. I have been other things as well, the policeman said. Thief, pimp, blackmailer, not to mention murderer. You should know. The policeman, if such he was, seemed to be moving towards him, and Walter suddenly became alive to the importance of small distances, the distance from the sideboard to the table, the distance from one chair to another. I don't know what you mean, he said. Why do you speak like that? I've never done you any harm. I've never set eyes on you before. Oh, haven't you, the man said. But you've thought about me, and you've written about me. You got some fun out of me, didn't you? Now I'm going to get some fun out of you. You hadn't any pity for me, had you? Well, I'm not going to have any pity for you. But I, I tell you, cried Walter, clutching the tail edge, I, I, I don't know you. And now you say you don't know me. You did all that to me, and then forget me. You forgot William Stainsforth. William Stainsforth? Yes. I was your scapegoat, I? You unloaded all your self-dislike on me. Now, as one W.S. to another, what shall I do? If I behave in character, I... Uh, I don't know, muttered Walter. You don't know? You ought to know. You fathered me. What would William Stainsforth do if he met his old dad in a quiet place? His kind old father, who made him swing. I'm going to give you one. That shows you never understood me, doesn't it, Dad? Walter said nothing. Well, if you can tell me of one virtue you ever credited me with, just one kind thought, just one redeeming feature, yes, said Walter, trembling. Well, then, I'll let you off. And uh, if I can't, whispered Walter, well, then, that's just too bad. We'll have to come to grips, and you know what that means. Walter began to pant. I'll give you two minutes to remember. They both looked at the clock. At first, the stealthy movement of the hand paralysed Walter's thought. Desperately, he searched his memory for one fact that would save him. He thought, and suddenly his mind relaxed, and he saw printed on it like a photograph the last page of the book. Then, with the speed and magic of a dream, each page appeared before him in perfect clarity, until the first was reached. And he realised with over... In all that evil, there was not one hint of good. And he felt compulsively, and with a kind of exultation, that unless he testified to this, the cause of goodness everywhere would be betrayed. There's nothing to be said for you, he shouted, and you know it. Of all your dirty tricks, this is the dirtiest. You want me to whitewash you, do you? The very snowflakes on you are turning black. How dare you ask me for a character? I've given you one already. God forbid that I should ever say a good word for you. I'd rather die. Stainford's hand shot out. Then die, he said. The police found Walter Streeter slumped across the dining table. His body was still warm, but he was dead. It was easy to tell how he died, for it was not his hand that had shaken, but his throat. Walter Streeter had been strangled. Of his assailant, 
there was no trace. On the table and on his clothes were flakes of melting snow. But how it came there remained a mystery, for no snow was reported from any district on the day he died. There's someone coming down in the lift, Mummy. No, my darling, you're wrong. There isn't. But I can see him through the bars. A tall gentleman. You think you can, but it's only a shadow. Now you'll see, the lift's empty. And it always was. This piece of dialogue, or variations of it, had been repeated at intervals ever since Mr and Mrs Malden and their son Peter had arrived at the Brompton Court Hotel, where, owing to a domestic crisis, they were going to spend Christmas. New to hotel life, the little boy had never seen a lift before and was fascinated by it. When either of his parents pressed the button to summon it, he would take up his stand some distance away to watch it coming down. The ground floor had a high ceiling, so the lift was visible for some seconds before it touched floor level, and it was then at its first appearance that Peter saw the figure. It was always in the same place, facing him in the left-hand corner. He couldn't see it plainly, of course, because of the double grill, the gate of the lift and the gate of the lift shaft, both of which had to be firmly closed before the lift would work. He had been told not to use the lift by himself, an unnecessary warning because he connected the lift with the things that grown-up people did. And unlike most small boys, he wasn't over-anxious to share the privileges of his elders. He was content to wonder and admire. The lift appealed to him more as magic than as mechanism. Acceptance of magic made it possible for him to believe that the lift had an occupant when he first saw it, in spite of the demonstrable fact that when it came to rest, giving its fascinating click of finality, the occupant had disappeared. If you don't believe me, ask Daddy, his mother said. Peter didn't want to do this, and for two reasons, one of which was easier to explain than the other. Daddy would say I was being silly, he said. Oh, no, he wouldn't. He never says you're silly. This was not quite true. Like all well-regulated modern fathers, Mr. Malden was aware of the danger of offending a son of tender years. The psychological results might be regrettable, but Freud or no Freud, fathers are still fathers, and sometimes when Peter irritated him, Mr. Malden would let fly. Although he was fond of him, Peter's private vision of his father was of someone more authoritative and awe-inspiring than a stranger seeing them together would have guessed. The other reason which Peter didn't divulge was more fantastic. He hadn't asked his father, because when his father was with him, he couldn't see the figure in the lift. And Mrs. Malden remembered the conversation and told her husband of it. The lift is a dark place, she said. I dare say he does see something. He's so much nearer to the ground than we are. The bars may cast a shadow and make a sort of pattern that we can't see. I don't know if it's frightening him, but you might have a word with him about it. At first, Peter was more interested than frightened. Then he began to evolve a theory. If the figure only appeared in his father's absence, didn't it follow that the figure might be, could be, must be, his own father? In what region of his consciousness Peter believed this, it would be hard to say. But for imaginative purposes he did believe it, and the figure became for him... Daddy in the lift. The thought of Daddy in the lift did frighten him, and the neighbourhood of the lift shaft, in which he felt compelled to hang about, became a place of dread. Christmas Day was drawing near, and the hotel began to deck itself with evergreens. Suspended at the foot of the staircase in front of the lift was a bunch of mistletoe, and it was this that gave Mr Malden his idea. As they were standing under it, waiting for the lift, he said to Peter, Your mother tells me you've seen someone in the lift who isn't there. His voice sounded more accusing than he meant it to, and Peter shrank. Oh, 
Not now, he said, truthfully enough. Only sometimes. Your mother told me that you always saw it, his father said, again more sternly than he meant to. And do you know who I think it might be? Caught by a gust of terror, Peter cried, Oh, please don't tell me. Why, you silly boy, said his father reasonably. Don't you want to know? Ashamed of his cowardice, Peter said he did. Why, it's Father Christmas, of course. Relief surged through Peter. But doesn't Father Christmas come down the chimney? he asked. Oh, that was in the old days. He doesn't now. Now he takes the lift. Peter thought a moment. Will you dress up as Father Christmas this year? he asked, even though it's an hotel. I might. And come down in the lift? I shouldn't wonder. After this, Peter felt happier about the shadowy passenger behind the bars. Father Christmas couldn't hurt anyone, even if he was, as Peter now believed him to be, his own father. Peter was only six, but he could remember two Christmas Eves, when his father had dressed up as Santa Claus and given him a delicious thrill. He could hardly wait for this one, when the apparition in the corner would at last become a reality. Alas, two days before Christmas Day, the lift broke down. On every floor it served, and there were five, six counting the basement. The forbidding notice, out of order, dangled from the door handle. Peter complained as loudly as anyone, though, secretly, he couldn't have told why, he was glad that the lift no longer functioned. And he didn't mind climbing the four flights to his room, which opened out of his parents' room and had its own door, too. By using the stairs, he met the workmen. He never knew on which floor they would be, and from them gleaned the latest news about the lift crisis. They were working overtime, they told him. They were just as anxious as he to see the last of the job. Sometimes they even told each other to put a jerk into it. Always Peter asked them when they would be finished, and they always answered, Christmas Eve at latest. Peter didn't doubt this. To him, the workmen were infallible, possessed of magic powers, capable of suspending the ordinary laws that governed lifts. Look how they left the gates open and shouted to each other up and down the awesome lift shaft, paying as little attention to the other hotel visitors as if they didn't exist. Only to Peter did they vouchsafe a word. But Christmas Eve came. The morning passed, the afternoon passed, and still the lift didn't go. The men were working with set faces and a controlled hurry in their movements. They didn't even return Peter's good night when he passed them on his way to bed. Bed. He had begged to be allowed to stay up this once for dinner. He knew he wouldn't go to sleep, he said, till Father Christmas came. He lay awake, listening to the urgent voices of the men, wondering if each hammering stroke would be the last. And then, just as the clamour was subsiding, he dropped off. Dreaming, he felt adrift in time. Could it be midnight? No, because his parents had, after all, consented to his going down to dinner. Now was the time. Averting his eyes from the forbidden lift, he stole downstairs. There was a clock in the hall, but it had stopped. In the dining room there was another clock, but dared he go into the dining room alone, with no one to guide him and everybody looking at him? He ventured in, and there at their table, which he couldn't always pick out, he saw his mother. She saw him too, and came towards him, threading her way between the tables as if they were just bits of furniture, not alien islands under hostile sway. Darling, she said, I couldn't find you. Nobody could. But here you are. She led him back and they sat down. Daddy will be with us in a minute. The minutes passed. Suddenly there was a crash. It seemed to come from within, from the kitchen, perhaps. Smiles lit up the faces of the diners. A man at a nearby table laughed and said, Something's on the floor. Somebody'll be for it. What is it? whispered Peter, too excited to speak out loud. Is anyone hurt? Oh, no, darling. Somebody's dropped a tray, that's all. To Peter it seemed an anticlimax, this paltry accident 
that had stolen the thunder of his father's entry, for he didn't doubt that his father would come in as Father Christmas. The suspense was unbearable. Can I go into the hall and wait for him? His mother hesitated, and then said yes. The hall was deserted. Even the porter was off duty. Would it be fair, Peter wondered, or would it be cheating and doing himself out of a surprise if he waited for Father Christmas by the lift? Magic has its rules which mustn't be disobeyed. But he was there now, at his own place in front of the lift, and the lift would come down if he pressed the button. He knew he mustn't, that it was forbidden, that his father would be angry if he did, yet he reached up and pressed it. But nothing happened. The lift didn't come. And why? Because some careless person had forgotten to shut the gates, monkeying with the lift, his father called it. Perhaps the workmen had forgotten in their hurry to get home. There was only one thing to do, find out on which floor the gates had been left open and then shut them. On their own floor it was, and in his dream it didn't seem strange to Peter that the lift wasn't there, blocking the black hole of the lift shaft, though he dared look down it. The gates clicked too. Triumph possessed him. Triumph lent him wings. He was back on the ground floor, with his finger on the button. A thrill of power such as he had never known ran through him when the machinery answered his touch. But what was this? The lift was coming up from below, not down from above. And there was something wrong with its roof, a jagged hole that let the light through. But the figure was there in its accustomed corner, and this time it hadn't disappeared. It was still there. He could see it through the mazy criss-cross of the bars, a figure in a red robe with white fur edges and wearing a red cowl on its head. His father, Father Christmas, Daddy in the lift. But why didn't he look at Peter? Why was his white beard streaked with red? The two grills folded back when Peter pushed them. Toys were lying at his father's feet, but he couldn't touch them, for they too were red, red and wet as the floor of the lift, red as the jag of lightning that tore through his brain. How stealthily, like the imperceptible approaches of a painless but fatal illness, does a passion for the antique grow on one. Timothy Carswell had inherited some oriental china, enough to dress a chimney piece and fill a corner cupboard. His friends congratulated him, and he was full of the pride of possession. When that wore off, he lost interest, and was half inclined to agree with his maid that ornaments so breakable ought not to be left about. But one day an elderly relation told him that in the time of his great-grandmother, a certain plate had been used for feeding the chickens. Yes, here it was. Great excitement. And as Timothy doubtless knew, was famille verte and valuable. When she had gone, Timothy studied the plate. From a circular yellow medallion in the centre radiated branches bearing blue flowers and mauve flowers, and terracotta roses with leaves of two shades of green. It was the leaves that especially fascinated Timothy. The point of transition between the two greens, where they leaned towards each other, affected him almost as deeply as a change of key in Schubert. He was horrified to think of the chickens pecking at the leaves, and replaced the plate on the chimney-piece with exaggerated care. Now the china was his chief delight, and though none of the other pieces gave him quite the same satisfaction as the plate, they all gave him something to read about, to discuss, and to contemplate in a dreamy mood between thought and feeling, which he found extremely seductive. And so it was with bitter disappointment that he learned from the porter of a London museum that the ceramics department was still closed for repairs. Come again in three years' time, the man told him with a twinkle. But to Timothy, even three minutes seemed too long to wait. He 
He'd come up to London to see Chinese porcelain, and Chinese porcelain he would see. A bus hove in sight, going to a region north of the park where antique shops abounded. Timothy got in. The inside of the shop was much larger than one would have guessed from the street. A thick carpet muffled Timothy's tread. There was no one about, so he tiptoed up to the shelves which lined the walls, and, looking at one piece after another, tried to measure, in terms of feeling, the attraction that each piece might have for him. Suddenly he stopped, for on a shelf above his head was a vase that arrested his attention as sharply as if it had spoken to him. Who can describe perfection? I shall not attempt to, nor even indicate the colour. For like a pearl, the vase had its own colour, which floated on its surface more lightly than morning mist hangs on a river. You are looking at this vase, I said a voice at his elbow, a courteous voice, but it made Timothy jump. You are right to admire it. It is a unique piece. The speaker was a clean-shaven man of middle height and middle age, with an urbane manner and considerable presence. "'It is most beautiful,' said Timothy, and was immediately abashed at having spoken to a stranger in such a heartfelt tone. His interlocutor turned and called into the depth of the shop, "'Get the cellar the vase down, and show it to the gentleman.' "'Yes, Mr. Joshagan." One of several men who had suddenly appeared from nowhere brought some steps, and with an expressionless face took down the vase and set it on a table. Turn on the light, commanded the proprietor. So illuminated, the vase shone as if brightness had been poured over it. It might have been floating in its own essence, so insubstantial did it look. Through layer on layer of soft transparency, you seem to see right into the heart of the vase. Claire de Lune, said Mr. de Chagan. Ming, uh, he shrugged his shoulders, perhaps. We do not guarantee. You like the vase, sir? How much is it? asked Timothy, absently. He started when he was told the sum, and yet he thought it might have been much more. How can you put a price on perfection? He gave the proprietor a regretful smile to indicate that the vase was not for him. Too much, eh? said Mr. Joshagan, in a business-like tone. Come here, Mr. Kerman, and tell this gentleman what you think about this vase. Mr. Kerman, detaching himself from the little pack, came forward and looked down thoughtfully at the vase. It is a wonderful piece, Mr. Toshagan, he said. In all our experience, we have never had one like it. This gentleman would be well advised to buy it, if only as an investment. You see, said Mr. Toshagan, come here, Mr. Solstice, and tell this gentleman what you think about this vase. Dark-browed and aquiline like his predecessor, Mr. Solstice joined them and stared down at the vase. "'It is a bargain. Indeed it is, sir,' he said earnestly. "'You would not find a vase like this wherever you looked. "'It is a piece of extraordinary good fortune that we are able to offer it to you.' Mr. Joshagan raised his eyebrows at Timothy and gave his hands a half-turn outwards. "'You hear? He agrees with the other. "'We will ask again. Come here, Mr. Doverman, and tell this gentleman... No, no, uh, please, don't bother, cried Timothy, forestalling almost rudely Mr. Doverman's testimony. I, I couldn't possibly... He stopped and looked with distaste at the vase, its lustre dimmed by all the exudations of commerce that so thickly smeared it. How could he have dreamed? Into the moody silence round the vase came the sound of the shop door opening and a shadow moved along the carpet. Ah, exclaimed Mr. Toshagan, what a good chance. Here is Mr. Smith of Manchester, in the nick of time. Mr. Smith, if you will be so kind, tell this gentleman what you think about this vase. Sharp-featured, sandy-haired, and very English-looking, Mr. Smith seemed embarrassed. 
He stroked his chin, cleared his throat, and said with an effort, Well, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? At once, Timothy's mood changed. The others had all spoken for the vase. Mr. Smith, more perceptive, had said the vase spoke for itself. It did. It needed no recommendation from anyone. It had perfection. It was perfection. The absolute in terms of a vase. If Timothy possessed it, he would have the absolute always at his command. Had his life been a quest, it would have ended here. But the price was totally disproportionate to his capital, his income, his way of life, and his prospects. To pay it would be a step towards madness. Worried by the pressure of the wills around him, he shook his head. Mr... Uh, said Mr. Joshagan softly. I do not have the pleasure of knowing your name. Carswell, said Timothy. Mr. Carswell, said Mr. Joshagan, as reverently as if the name was a benediction. Do you know that Lord Mountbatten will soon be leaving India? Timothy stared at him. He had been so deeply absorbed in the vase that he could not get India into focus. I suppose so, he said doubtfully. Mr. Carswell, repeated Mr. Joshagan, India is a very large place. Very large, Timothy agreed, hoping he was not going to get drawn into a political argument. What would you say was the population of India? Mr. Joshagan eyed him closely. Timothy was fond of statistics. Four hundred million, he replied with unkind promptness. But to his surprise, Mr. Joshagan was not in the least put out. Four hundred and fifteen million, to be exact, he said. And what fraction would that be of the total population of the world? About a fifth. Again, Mr. Joshagan did not seem to mind having his aces trumped. You are quite right, Mr. Carswell, he said slowly and impressively. There are two thousand million people in the world, and not one of them could make this vase. The onlookers stood with downcast eyes, like donors in a picture. But to Timothy they had multiplied, multiplied into the two thousand million people of the world for whom the making of this vase must forever remain an unattainable ideal. The poetry of the idea swept over him, loosening his heartstrings. I'll have it, he said. I congratulate you, said Mr. Joshagan. Immediately the knot of tension broke. The cloud of witnesses, their faces indifferent now, melted away. Even Mr. Joshagan, still murmuring compliments, withdrew into his office. Timothy was left alone with his prize. How could he bear to be separated from it? But there is no need, said Mr. Joshagan, when consulted about payment. We will gladly accept your check, and you can take the vase away with you. Joy surged up in Timothy again, and he could hardly refrain from embracing Mr. Joshagan. I will arrange for it to be packed said Timothy's benefactor, pocketing his cheque and bowing himself away. Meanwhile, perhaps you would like to have another look round. We may have other vases. Timothy smiled, for of course there were no other vases in the world. But there was plenty to look at, and plenty of reason every time he looked to congratulate himself that his vase was not as these. His mind had travelled far before the assistant returned, bearing an immense square box which he respectfully tendered to Timothy. How solid beauty was! Clasping it, almost eclipsed by it, Timothy moved towards the door. Another customer had come in, another vase was being displayed, and as Timothy passed by, he heard Mr. Joshagan say, there are two thousand million people in the world, Mr. Gainfoot, and not one of them 
But Timothy did not care, for before him, like a buckler against all those millions, he was carrying the absolute.